welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. Coming up next on the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. Each individual and community has unique needs. It's not like a one size fits all. So make sure you're actually talking to the people that you're working with to see what they need and what would help them just to show that you value them as an individual. I would encourage any other library or institution looking to become more inclusive to recognize that if you don't have the background to recognize that you are not an expert and that you should partner with those who are to help this initiative so that you can be intentional. And like Allison said, you can have a greater impact. Back in May, I got to sit down and talk to Brittany Jacobs and Allison Richard from Burlington Public Library in Iowa. They are currently working through the process of getting sensory certified. We had a great conversation about how we can make spaces more accessible for sensory needs. We talked about the different ways the library helps to adapt their physical space to make it more inclusive and their plans to expand on this work in the future. We also talked about working with the community to create an inclusive and welcoming space, such as partnering with expert organizations, schools, and families to truly understand everyone's needs and experiences. So let's dive right in to find out more about what the Burlington Public Library is doing. Hello, and welcome to the Assembly and Inclusion podcast. Today, I am here with Brittany Jacobs and Allison Richard from the Burlington Public Library System. Brittany is the Manager of Outreach and Program Services, and Allison is the Youth Services Library Assistant. So Brittany and Allison, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. So first of all, I guess we'll just jump right into it. What made you want to start the process of making the library more sensory friendly and sensory inclusive? So I've always been a very sensitive person and I am very aware and feel like it's important to be active in instances of inequity, whether it's racial or social, or in this case for the neurodiverse community and people with disabilities. Before I started at the library, I worked in our local school district for a couple of years, one year in the elementary level and one year in the high school level, and all of my time was in special education. And I worked a variety of different positions from one-on-one to classroom setting to doing job coaching with students at the high school. And I really enjoyed getting to know the kids that I worked with. Um, And one of the teachers I had actually worked with at the elementary level, when I started working at the library, she reached out to me and the schools have transitioned a little bit where they actually have three autism classrooms in one building. And she reached out to see if I would want to come and do any story times for their kids. So of course, I was like, yes, we had done a couple of sensory programs at the library in the past just to kind of pilot it and see how it went. And we had a couple of families attend But then when COVID hit, all programming was put on pause. So this was actually last fall that I started doing story times once a month in the autism classrooms. And shortly after that, one of the school, it was actually the speech pathologist that worked closely with some of these kiddos reached out to me and she was like, can we meet sometime just to kind of discuss ways that we can partner with you guys at the library to better serve our kids, not just in school, but out of school, at the library, out in the community in general. So this meeting that we had over Zoom, I filled probably two pages of a notebook with all of these cool ideas of things that we could do. And it just kind of sparked that interest. And having Brittany as a supervisor and giving support and just really, yes, we want to do this was crucial, I think, and actually getting the ball rolling on some of these things that we wanted to do. And then from like a really broad perspective, libraries are going through this transition of 
leaving this data-centered method and pedagogy and going toward a human-centered design. And a lot of that is encompassing inclusivity in a variety of forms. But here at Burlington Public Library, what we chose to do was focus on four specific areas for inclusivity. And it's our space, our building. A lot of public libraries are very old buildings and they've been grandfathered into old standards. And so they're not ADA compliant. So we're looking at our physical space and trying to decide how can we be more inclusive physically speaking with our building and our space. We're also looking at our collections and trying to determine, can is there room for growth as far as like books written in braille or more audiobooks or how are we displaying our books? And so everything from the content that we carry in our books to how we display the collection. The third area we're looking at is customer service. And a lot of that is kind of wrapped into what we'll talk about in a little while as far as our inclusivity initiative with a neurodivergent community. But we're looking at how we are front facing with the public and how we talk about the public and how we talk with the public. And then the fourth area we're looking at is programming. So space collections, customer service and programming. And this is kind of the umbrella and underneath of that fall several different projects. But this inclusivity project that Allison is spearheading with the neurodivergent community has become the front runner because we've been able to make quite a bit of progress considering the fact that we started this in January. That was your first meeting, right? Allison was in January and here we are at the tail end of May. And it feels like we're rocking and rolling with this one. So it's exciting to see that type of immediate change, but this is a really great example of a granular scale of what libraries at large in this country are doing to move away from the data-centered mindset to a human-centered mindset. I didn't realize it was January. That's that's really impressive. That's only been a couple of months then since that conversation happened. I know you have probably other things you want to do, but so many changes have already taken place in that time frame. That's really impressive. In terms of physical spaces, you had mentioned physical spaces. What physical elements have been changed to be more supportive of people who may have different sensory needs? Have there been any changes so far in that regard? So when we had the AEA, which is Area Education Agency, so it's an organization that provides support to teachers. So they have speech pathologists, school social workers, school psychologists, a variety of teams that support the school. We had them come in and when we did one of our trainings, we did kind of a walkthrough of the physical space just to kind of get their input as professionals of what maybe works well and what doesn't. And it was really positive to hear that they said a lot of the things that the library has in place already are really already supportive of an inclusive environment. Physically, we're an ADA compliant building, so we have that. The library in general is a fairly calm, quiet space. I mean, during the summer, it just gets a lot more, but overall, the library, they had a lot of positive things to say. We got some light filtering panels that are cloud that I put up over my desk and our lights out in the children's area are half that size. So we're gonna try and like cut them, but we're going to have some of those just to adjust the light because fluorescent lights can just be too much for people with different sensitivities. We got a wind tunnel. So it wasn't necessarily specifically for the sensory collection, but it is, a wonderful tool for kids of all abilities to use. So it's basically this wooden platform with a powerful fan and a large like PVC tube that goes up and the wind blows up. So the kids can put scarves or balloons or other things in and then also just kind of explore the feel, the physical feel of the air and the movement. And a lot of like the toys and things that we have out in the kids department are really work well. Long-term, We'd really like to get a calming room that's accessible 20, not 24 seven, but when the library is open, unlocked, accessible to anyone, kids, but also adults that may use it. I have it pictured in my mind. So like kind of a quieter fiber optic light, the ability to play quiet music if they'd like fidgets, comfortable seating. So that's kind of a long term on the wish list. One of the things I think I want to preface on the onset is Allison and I and everyone on our staff here recognize that we are not experts in this. 
Allison's done a really nice job partnering with those who are experts. And so we're trying to be super intentional with the things that we do do and avoid just shooting in the dark to see what sticks. And so we had the AEA weigh in on our space and our building. And then we had an official and very in-depth ADA audit done just about it was two and a half or three weeks ago, and we're still waiting on the results of that. Big major things are ADA compliant in this space, but there are a few things like there's quite a few tight turns in between the stacks, and it's not, I don't think it's like a total, totally compliant space when you navigate in between all these bookshelves. And then we also did an audit of the space just to see how people use it. And when the building was designed and when we think about this space as staff, we anticipate people following certain pathways when they come into the building. And then when this small group of us sat down and we observed people in the building, it turns out they don't in fact use what we would anticipate they use. So they like make a left-hand turn way sooner into the kids area than the space is designed for. And it's a very tight fit if you have a stroller or if you are in a wheelchair or if you have a walker or some other type of device with you. And it's the most <laughs> difficult way to get into the main area of the kids space, but it's also, it makes sense now when I think about people coming into the building, it's the fastest way to get small children into the toy area. And so that's the route that they take, but it is not ADA compliant. And so there are some little things within the building. And we also realize that we only have two braille signs in the entire building. One on the public facing bathrooms and one on the staff elevator. None of our end caps, none of our shelving units, none of the individual rooms, nothing beyond those two spaces have any braille in them. So there's lots of opportunity for growth as far as our space goes, but because that involves people from organizations who are experts on this, that's a little bit of a time it just has more time built into that whole process because we have to wait for an official report to come back and then we have to present it to our two boards and then we have to follow the due process to get things changed on a larger scale. But it was nice to get that immediate feedback from the AEA about the building and we are trying to implement some hands-on interactive things for differently abled kiddos in the space, but like the larger changes are going to be a long time coming because there's a lot of hoops we have to jump through to, to get there. I could see that being definitely a longer part of the journey, but it's nice that you're taking some of those steps to get it started and then realizing that it's not going to be necessarily the end of the line for a little while, but there are steps you could take now, like the lighting, which is awesome. And the possibility of the future calming space, which I love. I was a special education teacher, so I know my students would have loved something like that in the classroom just to kind of have that space that they know they could go to. So I think that's an awesome plan going forward. You did mention something about, I think, fidgets and toys. I know some people who are doing like certifications for sensory needs, they do things like sensory bags. Is that something that your library is doing or thinking of doing? So we put together four bags. I think we've had them available for a couple months now. And right now the bags are in for in-house use so they could come up. They don't have to like check it out. They just ask for it and they can use it while they're here at the library. And they have noise reducing headphones, a variety of fidgets, these little calming timers. It has like water and different like ink colors. And when you flip it upside down, so it's calming, but it can also be used like as a, a visual timer. So if there's a parent that maybe their kiddo has a tough time with transitions we're gonna leave when the ink settles to the bottom. So it's a visual for them. Communication cards. So they're actually the same cards that the kids use in the school that we just put on a lanyard. And right now they have very basic cues, but I would like to add some library specific ones to them to make it more accessible while they're at the library. Oh, and the library social story. So we have a social story and that's something that I need to get circulating. <laughs> right now it's just, I printed it on like four by six and it's stapled together, but it's an intro to what their experience will be like while they're at the library. But I wanna get it actually printed in a real book and then they can check it out because it doesn't really do much good at the library. It's best to read at home before they come to the library. So those are currently 
um, available in-house, but we're looking at getting them, some of them available to circulate so they can take them wherever they're going in the community. And we also have a few things that will be added to them. We have weighted lap mats, fidget seats, and we even have one like sensory body sock. So we just kind of need to figure out the cleaning of some of these items in between circulation, which gets a little bit tricky. One of the cool things I wanted to mention while talking about those, so up at the desk, we have a sign, and then we also have actually the stuff that's in one of the kits just displayed and saying, if you'd like to check out a sensory bag, ask the staff. And so many times I've been up at the desk and this has sparked conversations with parents and their kids even if they are not neurodiverse, like, what is this? And the parents can start a conversation with their child about, so some kids have trouble when things get really noisy. So it's not even just for the kids who might need it, but also to spark conversations with younger kids about accepting differences and just learning, learning about diversity in the community. Oh, I love that. That's a really wonderful side effect of yeah. having it available. I, I think that's, that's huge. Just even start, especially with young, young children, getting that conversation going early and having more of that acceptance and awareness. That's really wonderful that that's happening already. So I want to talk a little bit about programming and activities you had mentioned, I think at the beginning that you were doing some sensory programs pre-COVID. Since starting the certification initiative, has anything changed in terms of programming and activities to make them more inclusive? I know you were doing it before, but is there anything new you're doing? So after meeting with the school and AEA staff, we worked with them to have a sensory night in January. And we actually had some of the staff there at the library for the event. We even had one of the school counselors bring their therapy dog. So we really worked closely with the teachers and they were communicating with parents about here's this event that we really think your kids would benefit from and enjoy for the kids, but as well as the parents to just be able to network and for the siblings of the kids in the classes. And it was a small attendance, but it was very meaningful, I think, for the families that did come. It was a very passive program. It was after hours, so it was after the library had closed. So it was just the families that were attending the program that were at the library. And it was more of a come and explore, check out books, ask questions versus actually having, okay, we're going to sit at the table and do this activity now. Because some of these families had never been to the library before. And one of the families specifically said, I don't think we'd ever have come to the library if you didn't have this event. And I don't know if it was having it after hours or that their teacher would, was there to offer extra support if they needed it, but I just thought that was pretty mind-blowing. Like, How many people are out there in the community that aren't coming to the library because they don't feel the support or they're scared that something's going to happen and this is not a place for them? One of the other things that we've done is collect feedback from teachers and parents and as far as programming goes, it was an overwhelming response that they want programming that's inclusive, not set aside specific for, I mean, we are offering these after hour programs to get kids introduced to the library, but as far as like, for instance, summer programming goes, it's, they didn't ask to have like separate classes for just neurodiverse kids. They wanted their kids to be folded in and included in the programming that we currently have running. And so Allison created this questionnaire that you get when you sign up for any registered program that involves a series of questions to kind of see what other ways can we support you in this program or do you have any comments or questions or about this program so this has been a good way to show the community that we are trying to be better as far as what we currently offer and more intentional about being inclusive in our in our programs. Allison, what are some of those specific questions that you put on the the registration feedback? One of them is, are there any specific accommodations that could help your child to participate in this program? Is there anything that staff can do to support you in your visit to the library? I think I asked like a food sensitivity or allergy question, but just incorporating those in all of our events. So across the board, 
to make it more, okay, this is something we are doing for every program on a regular basis. And, and I think- did you get a really it. nice piece of feedback on one of those responses from somebody on the website forum? I thought somebody wrote back and said, thank you for asking these. Oh, or... someone said, yeah, somebody said no, but I really appreciate that you're asking this. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really nice. I think that's great too. I mean, just in terms of inclusivity, just making sure that what you're providing is supportive for everyone. That's something I wish more organizations would do. So I agree with that person who wrote that. That's really great that you're taking that feedback into consideration when you're designing your activities and programs, in addition to offering the students and the young students and parents the chance to come together after hours to kind of get acquainted before you dive in to the full experience with everyone else. I did want to ask about the, the certification in general. So what is the steps for getting certified? So we are going through a, a program called, or a company called Culture City, and it's a sensory inclusivity certification, and it has three components to it. One is a training component. And so we have to have we're at the very, very beginning stages of this. We just started chatting with them a couple of weeks ago. I think it was the week that the Hawkeye article went live, um, which was great because now, and that article got picked up by the AP. So now like all of these people are holding us accountable to actually follow through with the certification <laughs> process. So we have to have a training, which will be great either as a reminder from what we've already gone through with AEA, because I don't know if we mentioned this, but AEA came to the library and did an all staff training with everyone on staff, everyone from shelvers all the way up to the director. And that was a really fabulous training. It was hyper local. So when she was speaking about families, it was people that we were seeing in the library or that we knew in the community. And again, they were the ones who came to the sensory evening in January with us. So we have a training component. There's, they have sensory kits that we will then put out on the front line and use ours as a backup to her, their sensory kits. And in the kits for that, it's very similar to what Alice has already put in our kits. So it's, a matter of branding with using Culture Cities kits ahead of our own. And then there's, we just have to buy into this program. And so those are the three components to it. And we're going to, I think we're, we're on the very beginning of our super busy time. So as teachers are getting ready to like sit down and decompress and relax for a couple of weeks, librarians are gearing up for summer reading. And it looks like we're going to start our training, like in the heart of summer reading. And so if we start end of June, beginning of July, we're aiming to have our certification process completed by the end of this calendar year. So hopefully by December 2022, January 2023, we'll have that certification. And then we'll continuously go through trainings to keep our skills and our knowledge up to date. And hopefully we're able to build upon the sensory kits that they give us to use and partner with other institutions. We took a field trip with the youth services team here at the library. We went up to the Children's Museum of Iowa up in Coralville and they got certified through the same company in the last year or two, I think they did. And so they were able to give us a good rundown of what to expect in this certification process. And a lot of it sounded like what we have already been doing on our own and in partnership with the AEA. So it makes sense to go through with this certification. And it's also a nice mark of approval from this higher entity that specializes in this to say that, yes, you what you're doing is intentional, it's well-researched, it's landing well with the community and we give you our seal of approval on it because we do want to be super intentional with all of this and like I said we are well aware that we're not experts but we want to partner with those who are and we want to use their expertise to help make ourselves and our library that much better and more welcoming. You had talked a little bit about long-term plans and things you wanted to do moving forward toward certification, toward becoming more sensory inclusive. Is there anything else that you have in the works in terms of inclusion that's coming up? Broadly speaking, we are trying to be as inclusive in every area where marginalized peoples are concerned. And so we have, we're really ramping up our outreach at the library and we've got presence at 
our Juneteenth program coming up at the Pride program coming up. And Burlington is a fairly small town. We've got 25,000 people here. And so the fact that there are community organizations that are kind of ramping up and self leading these festivals and events is pretty spectacular in and of itself, I think. I mean, I just moved here from Denver last November. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that there were some groups who were already doing this type of inclusivity work. And so it's made it a little bit easier for the library to participate in that capacity. But again, going back to those four areas of space, collection, customer service, and programs, this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as making this library as inclusive as possible. We want everyone who walks in here to feel fully welcome in their whole selves. And I'm excited to see how much further we can go with this neurodivergent track and then how we can widen it and really expand it into areas of inclusivity for all. There's not like an end point either. It's a continual, yeah. continual growth. And even like with new research and even just with language, like having this person as autistic and that is the preferred terminology for most of people actually in the autism community and not a differently abled person. The majority of people prefer, I'm disabled, I have disabilities. So just learning to respect the opinions and input of people from these communities versus necessarily just papers written. Because that was one thing I found interesting was a lot of times, maybe not now, but 10 years ago, the professionals preferred a person with autism or a person, the person first language and finding now that many people within the communities prefer not because like, this is part of who I am as a person. It's part of my identity. So it's just neat talking with kids, talking with adults and just learning what we can do better to support them, not just while they're at the library, but like in life and when they're out in the community. I like that point you made about that. It's a continuous journey. I think about the language a lot just because when I was training to be a special education teacher, they kind of emphasized that person first language and then getting out into the field, having students be like, nope, that's not the way I want to be referred to. It's a continuous learning process. There's new things coming out all the time. So I love the fact that you're so invested in the, we're just going to continue to evolve based on the needs of the people in the community. And my last question, what advice do you have for other libraries or workspaces in general who are looking to become more sensory friendly or inclusive? What advice would you give them? Um, I said, just start with one thing. It's so easy to be like when we had our first meeting, I wrote all these things down and it can seem overwhelming because there's so many things that we can do. But once your community sees that you are willing and wanting to make a conscious effort to be more welcoming and inclusive, it kind of lends itself to continuing that process and gaining support. Because since we've started, and again, this is a pretty short time frame, we've just reached a lot of people locally and even like nationally that have reached out to us. And we've received a couple of donations to use specifically for the accessibility collection and also work with community members, schools, libraries, any organizations that you think might be good to work with. And then also that each individual and community has unique needs. It's not like a one size fits all. So make sure you're actually talking to the people that you're working with to see what they need and what would help them just to show that you value them as an individual. I would encourage any other library or institution looking to become more inclusive to recognize that if you don't have the background, to recognize that you are not an expert and that you should partner with those who are to help this initiative so that you can be intentional. And like Allison said, you can have a, a greater impact with those type of community partners behind you. And it's also, don't let the a financial barrier stop you. We have zero budget for any of this. And anything that we want to do under this umbrella of outreach and programming is donation-based. And so we started on a shoestring budget of $100. And Allison was able to create those four sensory kits 
And then we had the partnership with AEA. They came in for free, very generously. They did two hour trainings with us and kind of laid the groundwork of why this is important. And here's a, a common language to use when we're talking about this community in different spaces. And we already had the four space collection service programs model ready to go. And so we were able to look at it through that lens. But we, like Allison said, we got a few donations coming in. We got a local community grant. And it's exciting to see the positive response from the community. And I think it's because it was not a single effort. We really joined forces with a lot of parties here in Burlington and we were able to gain a lot more momentum that way. So partner with local entities and champion each other's work and you'll go much further than you could alone. I think you both gave excellent pieces of advice. I really value the emphasis that you both put on the community. And I think it's evident that you seem to have a really nice working partnership with the different organizations in the community, whether it's the schools or other organizations. I just think that's something that's so beneficial and also makes things more inclusive because people start to feel connected and more welcome. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you both, Brittany and Allison, for being here today to share about your journey towards sensory certification and making the library more sensory friendly and inclusive with us. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for having, having us. <laughs>Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new, gave you a new idea, or showcased a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.